Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. Welcome to another edition of the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Ray. So good to have you. Today, we're going to talk about solar, but before we do that, I just want to take a second and say happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, including my dad, who has been a big influence on my life. Um, and if you don't know, I actually work for my father. I run a family-owned business, so that's one of the things that I do. And so thanks, Dad, for all that you've done for me. And to all the fathers out there, again, happy Father's Day. Uh, I know being a father is just a great, great joy. Now, on to the show, we have on Colin Tui, and we're going to talk about solar in unique areas and unique ways. And so this is another Forbes 30 under 30 on the energy list. And so I hope you enjoy the discussion that we had. Colin, thanks for coming on the show. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you? Good. Well, it's another Forbes 30 under 30, and I got to say at this point, I'm not sure how many we've had on, but I'm quite jealous. I am uh, never going to make the list because I'm over 30 now, but congratulations to you. Kind of tell us about the process, how it came about, and just what are some of the things that you've seen since being recognized by such a established name like Forbes? Thanks. Well, it does seem like there are more than 30 people. If you do the math, I don't really know where they come up with 30. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but they're all under yeah, 30, though, aren't they? They're all under Oh, 30. okay. Well, I was hoping um, I'm going to have a shot. there are more than 30 on the <laughs> list, so I'm not exactly sure what that's about. Anyway, no, it's been, it's been a pleasure, and I must say the direct contact with Forbes and people on the list has probably been less transformative than the people who have sort of reached out or come out of the woodworks. Especially as a small business owner, I think people take us a little bit more seriously now. And, you know, people congratulating you who you haven't spoken to in years and just the business getting a little bit of a kick. So that's been that's been super helpful. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, as small businesses, you're always trying to establish credibility. And it seems like being on the Forbes list uh, can go a long way in your marketing campaigns. Yeah, absolutely. It has. Okay, well, so let's talk about it. Just how did you get into energy? Um, you're an electrical engineer, so what was what was kind of your coming out of high school? You know, what was your thought process? Did you stumble into the energy business, or did you always say, "Hey, I want to be an energy"? No, I, I didn't actually. I studied engineering, electrical engineering, but that was a circuitous path which started with design and art and math and science, and I knew it was all related to creating and making and building. But I didn't know that engineering would be the thing. And I, in college, my sophomore year, I took an art class that I hated the first day. And I was walking around the campus and stumbled upon this building, which happened to be the engineering building, and met a professor who seemed really cool. And he said, come on in, I'm teaching a course in electronics and robotics. And I thought, that's pretty cool. And I started, and after the first week, he handed me the slip and said, okay, so this is your major, right? And I thought, let's do it. And so I signed it on the spot. And that's how I, quote unquote, decided to become an engineer, though it's a it's been a circuitous path since then as well. I, I really was interested in renewable energy generation. So the idea of creating electricity is so exciting to me. And there are many ways of driving turbines. There are many ways of creating electricity and trans some form of energy from thermal or from solar to uh, electrical energy, that really is what got me excited. And I can tell you right off the bat that it wasn't necessarily about renewables at first. It was really anything that generated electricity. I became really into Tesla, really into Edison. I just loved the idea. And then I thought, well, there are just so many things that we could use to harness this energy and so many sources where we have motion, where we have heat, where we have sun in the world, why not use more traditional energy generation methods, but use non-traditional sources? And that's really, that that's what got me excited is pairing source of motion or a source of kinematics with traditional turbine or a traditional sense of uh, converting something into electricity. And that, that's how the excitement was born in me. And then how I got into solar was a little bit of another story. Right. Well, that's kind of where I was going to go is that you've, you've kind of worked all over the renewable space. And so now you're in solar. So kind of give us just a short version. Um, did you go to solar because you think it's a more viable option than, than the other renewables or you just enjoy it more? Uh, I wouldn't say it's either of those. First of all, I, I wouldn't say that there's one viable option versus another viable option. You know, you're going to just like cars, you're going to have a 
truck and you're going to have a tiny car and you're going to have people who like SUVs and people who like sports cars, there's going to be diversity in your energy portfolio. And that means there's going to be solar and there's going to be wind and there's going to be gas and there's going to be coal and there's going to be biofuels. And so I'm not against the diversification of energy. I don't think that one methodology of renewable energy is going to solve the problem, but it's about the advancement of the the entire industry that's going to going to help lift all boats, if you will. But solar, no, I, I, I like I said, I am interested in taking materials that exist and that work and doing something else with them, creating another added value. And so that's how I really got into this form of solar, which is basically making fabric solar panels that are super lightweight. So you know, the idea of a solar cell is amazing. I think that the form factor of what a solar panel is, is limiting. Uh, you see Tesla coming out with solar shingles. It, it makes sense. You know, people don't necessarily want a four foot by six foot glass and aluminum rigid panel on their roof or everywhere plastering the landscape. So I said, what if we could convert this concept into a more integrated system? And so I worked with a company that did that. And my current partners in my business were my bosses at that company. And we were building solar powered tents. And so what we did was we evolved that from a military product into the commercial and architectural markets. And that's really been the evolution of Pavilion for the last six years. Okay, so I think on this show, we've, we've been fair to solar. We've brought on a lot of solar people to kind of give their mm-hmm. perspective. But outside of the show, and, and, and you, you go into the marketplace, there's always a lot of talk about you know how valid certain ideas are. And it seems that solar, more so than wind, takes a beating on, is it something that can actually work? Now, we brought on a lot of people that, that seems that, yeah, solar is viable now. And now maybe historically it was kind of overhyped, but it seems now that it's actually kind of coming into an age of its own. And if what I'm hearing you say is correct is that you're saying that not only is it here, um, now we're actually starting to think about it maybe in a more consumer-driven mindset, whereas before it was, okay, let's put on this big panel, this is what you need. And now, if I'm hearing you right, you're saying, okay, well, what does a consumer actually want? Has that kind of shift, is, is that kind of shift what I'm seeing from the solar industry saying, okay, what could a consumer use? And maybe historically it was more of, let's just kind of get a product out there or am I, am I missing something? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to pretend to say that what we do isn't unique and what we do isn't niche. But I, I think what you have to realize is that the sun is shining a lot and there are a lot of people that need electricity. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it all has to be at a utility scale. Every single one of us is walking around with a cell phone that is constantly dying. And I don't care how good the battery life gets on these phones. We need energy. We need USB ports. We need power constantly. You and I know that. Every one of my friends knows that. When you go to a concert, when you go to the beach, wherever you are, you need remote power. Well, yeah, and because that, the, you know, the, the, more, the, more, the more battery they give us on the cell phone, this, the more we use it. You know? So it's, yeah, it's like, yeah, it works for 12 absolutely. hours. Okay, well, that's 12 hours absolutely. I can use it. So what we're really trying to do is we're trying to make solar ubiquitous from a different perspective than typical roof-mounted panels. And we're saying, look, we can make solar that is powering your phone or your laptop in a remote location, whether that's whether that's for the military or a humanitarian aid shelter or just someone walking down the street with their backpack. You know, so we're really trying to make it more ubiquitous and when we talk about solar, we often talk about the ROI. What's the ROI of your iPhone charger? Tell me that. You spent 50 bucks on it. What's the ROI? Yeah, you depends need to calculate on, that? Yeah, yeah, dep- yeah, exactly. Well, it depends on what, what, how important that email I need to respond to is, you know what? Exactly, but no one is looking at a $50 product right. that they bought to charge their cell phone and calculating the ROI on it. Exactly. They're saying, this is a value that I need, right? And I need power wherever I go. So there doesn't necessarily have to be an ROI on a consumer product in the same way that as soon as you tie something into the utility grid, it's a largely financed, interest rate driven uh, annuity. And that's a little bit different than looking at it as a commercial or consumer product. And that's really what we're trying to do. Well, and I think you brought up ROI there. I think that's a, that's one of those terms that you know gets thrown out there a lot. ROI, ROI, and, and when you really start to break down a lot of stuff, you know, it's like, what's the ROI of this? Well, I, I don't know, and I, I don't, you know, what's the ROI of this conversation? Mean you're having? Well, well, who knows? Maybe this turns into something big. Maybe it doesn't. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter though, because um, we can't gauge everything off of just some kind of formula. Um, and I'm not diminishing the value of using the ROI formula, but but you you get what I'm saying is that you know if I have a client, exactly. if I have a client that sends me an email and I've got to respond uh, right then. 
and you got a charger and it's the only charger around, you say, hey, it's 500 bucks. Well, guess what I'm about to do? I'm about to write you a check for 500 bucks because I got to get this email out to a client. Now, yeah. if, if, if I'm driving on the road and no one's bothering me, then, then what does it matter if I respond to anything? If so, so it kind of fluctuates as well. And that kind of seems that you guys are saying, okay, well, that, okay, if you have your cell phone and, you know, some days you want to use it a lot and some days you don't, and there's not always chargers around, but here's a way to kind of mitigate that where you can say, okay, well, I always have a charger available. I, mean, I think there's a lot of value in that. Is that is that kind of what you're going for? Yeah, absolutely. And what we're trying to also do is to make it something that you don't have to think about. You don't have to think about the decision. Um, you know, if you're if it's integrated into a jacket or it's integrated into your beach blanket or it's integrated into a bag that you're bringing with you, you're not really thinking, oh, God, let me bring my charger. You're just thinking, oh, I'm using my bag. It's my gym bag. I bring it everywhere I go. And, you know, when I'm walking around for the hour that I walk outside every day on my commute, or I bike, uh, it's just going to charge my phone. I, I would like to see it as a, a, pro, a thought process that isn't really at the front of your brain. It's more just a, a passive thing. Absolutely. Now, one of the things I would imagine that you would face um, here is, okay, you know, you got, you got a phone charger or whatever it is that, you, you know, you, you guys have a lot of different spaces. I want to talk about some of those as well. But you got this phone charger. It's a hard plastic. It's got metal coming out of it. You know, it's kind of a time-tested thing. And now you're saying, hey, let's go to solar. And we think of solar, as you mentioned, big and bulky, and we're now shrinking it. What are some of the challenges that y'all faced as far as maybe people taking this technology seriously? Because anytime you change the size and scope of something, um, there's always going to be people going, eh, it's probably not durable anymore, or it probably doesn't last anymore. So what's been kind of some of the pushback you've gotten on that, and how have y'all responded? Well, so I think that the challenge that we face is to balance flexibility energy generation, aesthetics, and cost. So those are our those are our key indicators, right? And if you increase the efficiency, you may be increasing the cost, right? If you increase the flexibility, you may be increasing the cost. If you make something beautiful, you may be reducing the amount of power that it's going to produce, right? So it's those sliders and those tuners that we're constantly uh, working with. So part of the challenge for us is to is to work with someone and work with partners who are willing to go above and beyond with the types of products that they're willing to make. And so what that means is we want to work with folks who want to who want to build something that isn't techy and geeky. It's integrated fully into a consumer product. And that's key, right? So we can get early adopters who go, "Yeah, this is really cool. I want to charge my cell phone and my GoPro and all the stuff they carry with them all the time." That's fine and we're getting good business in that sense, but I also think that there's a huge market in the hidden solar cell that no one even really knows is there. And that's that's really part of what it's about, is to integrate solar cells into products that are already outside, they're already facing the sun, and, and no one's really going to notice. Yeah, and I'm looking at your website here, um, and we'll link to it in the show notes, pavilion.com, P-V-I-L-I-O-N.com. And, and what I'm seeing is is that you've got kind of a you know a collage here of pictures, and, and one on the top right, you've got a, a gentleman standing behind a uh, like a cart and his little canopy has solar panels. Mm-hmm. So what's kind of the thought process there? He can power his blender or whatever it is he's looking at, maybe making drinks or something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's actually a cart where they sell iced coffee uh, in a park in Brooklyn. And, you know, the idea behind an umbrella is in a situation in a park is in the summer to provide shade, right? So what we're saying is you are building something that has a surface area that's designed to get hit by the sun, why not integrate that with solar to do something, right? So instead of requiring a diesel generator, which they would have out there, uh, which is going to be loud and going to be costly and you have to refill and maintain, you just put some solar cells onto that fabric, you build a tent or you build, in this case, a shade canopy umbrella that's going to produce all the electricity for your refrigeration, for your cash register. I don't think there's a blender on that one, but basically um, it's an off-grid powering solution. And so that's where... You know, someone is going to ask about ROI from a business perspective, but it's not an ROI in terms of kilowatt hours produced. It's an ROI in terms of the value added. Right, right. Now, you mentioned a minute ago early adopters, and usually um, when you have early adopters, you're you're trying to get past that to the next to the next group. Um, Have y'all been successful to break it down to more of a closer to your more mass consumer base, or are you still in the kind of testing phases and throwing it out there and looking for the early adopters to take it to the masses? A little bit of both. I think that we're in the process of scaling to a point where it's it's going to become ubiquitous. And I think that really is an aesthetic challenge. It's how do you make this stuff beautiful and how do you make it so no one knows it's there? 
Yeah, and you know, I, I, I'm curious, and I'll be you know, tracking you guys over the, over the next couple of years because one of the things is uh, you, you said that you know, hey, make this stuff you know where, where it looks good, and you think about Bluetooth headsets. Um, you know, I have I have one, and I think everyone in the South has one that wraps around your neck. You know, it's got the two earbuds and they connect to your ear. Those are not good looking. <laughs> you know, they're just not. Mm-hmm. But once yeah. you realize the value of not having to have that little bitty thing that's in your ear, and you might lose that. This this bad boy sits in your neck. All of a sudden, the value of that thing it doesn't matter how it looks. So it's almost one of those things to where it seems uh, with some tech stuff that we come off and we say um, early on we want to look you know kind of snazzy and looks good and everybody likes it and then once you realize the value how it looks kind of goes down just a little bit because they realize that the value is there. Yeah, absolutely, and the price has to be there too. But but you're totally right. I mean, I think there are two ways of approaching it, and we approach it both ways. One is that the technology is inherently the beauty of it, right? So you see some architecture where the lighting is shown off and the wiring is shown off, and that's part of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have some where all the technology is totally hidden and everything is hidden. And we can go down both of those routes, and we're excited about both of those opportunities. Um, but I think to hit the mass market, it needs to be something that's beautiful, simple, and we don't really want to change habits fundamentally. Or I guess my point is we don't need to change habits to make this a good idea. I understand that. Okay, well, one of the things that I also noticed in, um, is that it looks like that you guys aren't really building anything. Um, you're, you're, you have your solar panels, but you're kind of using what's already in place there. What kind of got you in this in this mindset to say, hey, you mentioned it earlier, um, there's, the, there's the umbrella, there's, it kind of catches the sun. And I guess once you kind of thought about that from that perspective, it really probably opened up the door to all these other potential areas. Yeah, well, it's funny. Our challenge is not to figure out what to put solar cells onto. It's to figure out what not to put solar cells onto. Because if you were to just think about all of the fabric or all of the lightweight materials that are outside every single day, you, your mind would explode. And we constantly are thinking of ideas, but really what we have to do as a business is narrow down the ideas and say, okay, well, technologically, what are, what's the lowest hanging fruit? And then in terms of market adoption, what's the lowest hanging fruit, right? So a $500 bag that looks sort of techie and geeky that a high fashion company is going to make is not the lowest hanging fruit and the best way to advance our business. Though it's a good idea, we'd rather have something that's you know, a hundred dollars and looks like a normal backpack. So we're trying to balance what the good ideas are with the realistic business constraints. And we have ideas to five, 10 years down the road, but we're also saying, I think that at the end of the day, we want to have the lowest hanging fruit in terms of the market and in terms of the technology. We have a product roadmap two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, but we have technology that's available today and ready for the consumer market. And that's what we're most excited about because this stuff is real today. Absolutely. Now, we have a lot of uh, guests, that, uh, listeners that are international, and I can see this being a benefit, into, especially to some of our African listeners. Are y'all international or just in the States right now? No, we are. We are absolutely international. We are not currently a B2C business. We work with consumer products companies as partners, and we supply them with our materials, and we design and build their products. But at the end of the day, we're not selling to direct consumers. We're selling to brands, and they're selling to their consumers. So if it's an international brand, we're building international partners. If it's a domestic brand, we're building domestic partners. Great, great. Well, look, thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything else that you'd like to plug or promote before we let you get out of here today? No, give us a call if you have an idea as to where and how solar should be integrated into fabric. There are a lot of really good ideas out there. Maybe we haven't heard of all of them. And if there's anything specific, we'd love to work with someone. Absolutely. And we will link to all of Colin's information at the uh, globalenergymedia.com in the show notes where you can find him and his company and everything else that they have going on. Colin, this has been great. I love the idea. I love the concept. And uh, I just love talking to entrepreneurs in the marketplace because, um, you know, it's always good to see these fresh ideas coming out. And uh, some of the stuff that you guys have going on here, I think, is just uh, brilliant stuff. So thank you for coming on. And we hope to have you on again in the future. Thanks a lot, Ryan. I'm looking forward to it. Colin, thanks again for coming on. Really enjoyed the discussion. Be sure to check out the show notes, find more information about their company. You can find everything out there at globalenergymedia.com. And you know, this is a product that, you know, for a lot of our listeners, they may know someone who has a, you know, a a business that could benefit from this. You might have someone in, especially if you're in Houston, which we have a ton of listeners in Houston that have these um, covered 
parking areas. And you, you will see that on their website that that's one of the areas that they, they work for. And so, you know, think about that. Think about areas that this might can benefit you or friends, businesses that, that are out there already. So, again, hope you enjoyed the conversation. Until next time, keep climbing. The Global Energy Leaders Podcast is produced by Michael Sims and Chris Prine. Chris Prine also serves as editor for the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R-Squared Global. 